All right, and welcome to the RSP Film Room number 41, which is going to be featuring the illustrious Mr. Matt Harmon of footballguys.com and Backyard Banter, who authors the fabulous article, Reception Perception. Um, and before I welcome Matt onto the show, let's do our usual um, spoon feeding of legal vegetables. And that is that the videos posted here on the RSP film room are not hosted on this server. And the original video content is not considered the property of the RSP film room. The videos are considered to be used under the fair use doctrine of the United States copyright law, title 17, U.S. sections 107 through 118. Someday I'm going to have this down by heart, maybe by episode number 90. <laughs> videos are used on the site for editorial and educational purposes only. Look, we're just watching cut-ups of players, not even full games. They're little highlights offered by Draft Breakdown, an excellent site or that's on YouTube. And we're doing this totally to educate ourselves and educate um, our viewers. We're not trying to make any money off of this. So we're using it for educational and editorial purposes only. And the RSP Film Room and its staff of one, maybe two if you count my cat, maybe three if you count Eric Stoner. And... They, we don't claim any ownership of any of the original video content. The RSP Film Room and its staff don't use said video clips and advertisements, marketing for direct financial gain, uh, and all the video content in each clip is considered owned by the individual broadcast companies. So now that we've got our nutrition for the day, let's go ahead and get to the candy. So Matt, <laughs> Matt Harmon, <laughs> welcome back to the show. It's been a long time, and it's good to have you on. Oh, uh, it's not the first time I've been called Candy uh, today, or <laughs> but it's late at night, so it might be the last. Uh, you never, you can never be too sure, though. But yeah, thanks for having me back, Walden. This is this is great. Um, I really, you know, I really enjoyed my first visit, and um, especially we studied two guys that really were fun evals for me throughout the process, and um, I, we got another one on tap tonight that I'm really psyched to dig into. Yeah, I mean, maybe the next time we actually watch another wide receiver, it might not, maybe we could progress somewhere else in the alphabet because we watched Devontae Parker, we've watched Devontae um, Davis, and today we're going to watch Devin Smith. We can't even get past DEV, <laughs> it seems like, when, when it comes to players that we're selecting here. But, you know, obviously they all have something in common. And that is, is that they're big play threats mm -hmm. in, in a variety of ways, maybe different ways, but they certainly know how to get the job done and, and, and create for their offenses. So what is it about Devin Smith that if anyone has crawled <laughs> out from under a rock and hasn't seen reception perception, um, you know, you did, you've already done one on Smith. What are some things that, that you like about him? I know that we've talked about in the past that there are things that <laughs> maybe the general public thinks about him but may not be a, a completely accurate or general, or it's a bit of a generalization about his game. Yeah, so the, the great part about Smith was that he was one of those guys that, you know, the, the, the analysts that we've come to describe as big draft here in our little small town community, uh, you know, they started propping him up as sort of a first round prospect um, right when the draft game started getting going. And, you know, there was a lot of pushback from, from some guys on Twitter being like, no, this was a guy that was a day three prospect coming into the year. Like just because Cardale Jones threw him a couple bombs and he won a national championship game doesn't mean he's a, a good player. And like, so I see, so when I start studying draft prospects, that was kind of the environment that I was introduced to. Um, so I wanted to do a little, you know, my own investigation with that in mind. And so I start watching the cutups and everything like we're going to watch tonight. And I'm like, I obviously see a lot of the big play threats, but there's not, you know, just watching cutups. Like sometimes you don't get to see everything. Um, but then through reception perception, I was able to uh, uh, hound down five games of his all 22 from a site that's no longer uh, in service. And because uh, <laughs> that's the way the game works too. But um you know, so I was able to watch those games, and that's when I really developed just this all, this passion for my feelings about Devin Smith as a player. Um, and, you know, I, you mentioned reception perception. A lot of what I do there is track um, a metric that I call success rate versus coverage. Um, and on his nine routes, he posted by far, like, the most ridiculous stat I have logged for any player. He has a 90.5 success rate versus coverage on 
go routes or, or nine routes, you know, just so that's like I've been saying all along, that's just stupid. You don't, you just like nobody else has even come close to that. You know, it's way above the NFL average, the average for prospects I've done. So that's like having of, a money, that's like having a money back guarantee in yeah. like football terms for running a go route. Like I'll catch this go route or your money back. I mean, that's, all, that's about <laughs> as close as you're going to get for that. Exactly. And, and the title of the article that I wrote for football guys on Devin Smith is called, you know, Devin Smith and the value of a Trump card and Trump cards is kind of become one of my things that I've been using this, this off season. I, for, I just put my rankings up and Everybody that has a trump card, not everybody does, but everybody that does, I listed it. And Smith has the most real, tangible trump card in this draft class. That like, okay, you might be able to, you know, cover me three to- three downs in a row in the underneath game, or you might be able to block me out for this long. But eventually, I'm gonna throw my ace down, and I'm gonna beat you over the top for this big play. And I think we're gonna see- obviously we're gonna see some of that tonight. And so that just really makes me feel so comfortable about his pro projection on this one level. But then kind of as you hinted, I think there's some more there to be uncovered that the general public has kind of either dismissed or is just missing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great description of that, the value of the trump card. Well, the two games that we are going to watch tonight, folks, um, are going to be the Michigan State contest and the Wisconsin game. Um, again, these are just – these are games that were brought to us by Draft Breakdown. I'm watching the YouTube ver- version of these with um, Matt tonight, and it's just if you haven't seen this um, show before and you you haven't seen the other 40 episodes or any of the 40 episodes, this is just two guys watching film, breaking down what we usually look for when we're studying tape and sharing that with each other and the audience. We're talking about what we look at for the position, this in this case, wide receivers, what Devin Smith does specifically that we like as well as you know general things that come up during an evaluation of a player at a position that talk about the broader game of football so i mean that's a lot of what we're going to be doing and um so i'm going to bring up the tape make sure that matt can see it and we will get started um let's see here oh that's probably not what i want to do let's stop that all right i was going to say i still see you yeah, I brought up I brought up my own screen and I got the barbershop image. You know, you know how that goes where you've you know well you do yeah because you know if if you don't know Matt Harmon I like to bust on Matt because because you know obviously Matt and I are opposites. He's young, I'm old. He actually <laughs> cares about his appearance. I haven't cared about my appearance in about five years it seems like, and uh, I need to change that soon. But, well, you mentioned this is a very stripped down show, and I, I mean, you sent me this is, for, you know, to pull, peel back the curtain, we are, uh, you know, you, you sent me this kind of last minute, and I didn't even get a chance to do my hair, so we're very stripped down tonight. Yeah, um, see, there you go. See, there you go. So, so you're not going to see that, but, you know, I figured Matt was familiar with a barbershop. I'm, I'm wearing a cap because I haven't been familiar with a barbershop in several months, actually. So, um <laughs> So I, I either, yeah, I mean, we can, we can get into the looks I get at local restaurants lately um, where I live. Cause I just moved out into a little bit more of a country fied place and they're all sweet and nice people, but they all look at me a little askance right now. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that's a different story for another time. Um, so can you see the, can you see what I got up here for Devin Smith for the Michigan state game? Yep. Yes. Okay, I can. cool. We're good to go. So um. I'll start this in real time, and if we need to slow it down to to half speed, we'll do that. But we got Smith already down here. You know, we got empty set. We got him as the outside trips man. They're playing a little off coverage. Michigan likes to play some cover three on a, on occasion too. You're going to see that a, a fair bit probably, and we'll get this thing rolling. Right away, I mean, one of the things, you know, I mean, again, he, he, we're facing off coverage here, mm-hmm. but I like, I, you know, one of the things I particularly like about a receiver is just how they either attack the ball or how they pull the ball in. Yes. And he's very quick to get downhill and get just showed knees and elbow, or at least he, shoulders and knees in this case. Yeah, there's a lot of intent 
uh, in everything Smith does. And I think this is a really, just right off the bat, um, a really good example. You know, he gets his hands up, corrals the pass, brings it right in and gets that shoulder down. Yeah. And again, these are little things that really do separate the pros from good college players. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, I just did a show with Kyle Crabb on crabs on um max williams and it's some of the same stuff it's like he's always a half step ahead you always see him doing the next thing like at this play watch the watch him make the catch turn his head now you might say well you know this is how they drop footballs when you turn your head before you bring the ball in and that's true but at the same time it's important that you have there's a fine line between not doing that and you know, if you can't do that to some extent, you're not going to be able to get downfield and be prepared and protect the ball um, and earn yardage like this and get the first down. Yeah, I mean, look at how quick he does everything, too. Like, just between a couple clicks there, he's in the air, then he's on the ground, and then he's across that yellow line. I mean, and, like, I, it's boom, boom, boom. Yeah, and turning that shoulder away, turn the ball carrying shoulder yeah. away. That's just – see, to me, it's those little things that you're like – you're you are quick enough in the mind and in the processing ability to be a pro yep i i, I like that and like just right off the bat all right moving along Once again, we're, we're still underneath. We haven't seen anything, you know, haven't seen anything deep. No, nope, not that, not yet. I'll, I'll speed this sucker back up a little bit. It's a good break. Absolutely. You know, and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a bad pass, but it's a, per, it, it's not a perfect pass either. Um, you know, it kind of catches it you know, puts his hands up, gets it and corrals it again and then gets right downhill. And I like that when he does cross the body of this defender, again, he's very cognizant about how he protects the ball, giving him that side as opposed to letting the defender even get towards the ball. Again, you know, and these are the routes that, you know, these are the routes you got to win and be consistent at being able to catch if you're going to set up some of those deep balls. Yeah, if you're going to if you're going to get so much cushion and you see that a lot with deep guys, you're going to eat like you said, you're going to have to have these sort of things to keep to to exploit that. Uh, there are some NFL deep threats that I've charted um, that haven't been able to do the same thing. And, you know, it, it kind of takes away a little bit of that advantage. Yep, absolutely. And this is a, you know, watching this route here. Um, you know, again, willingness to work with his, with his teammate mm -hmm. doesn't work out, but you know, Brutus is upset, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> my wife always just like my wife. I can say this, Ohio State fans. I have so many Ohio State alumni in my family that I am almost by birthright an Ohio State alum. I know that may be sacrilege to some of you who don't have a degree, but I can make fun of Brutus. Seriously, I come from like a family of these guys. But my wife always is like curious about. She looks at at Brutus and she's like, "What the f is like that?" You know, like <laughs> I'm right there with her. I don't know what the hell that thing. Yeah, is. yeah. I had to explain to her that that was a nut from a tree, but she she didn't quite get that <laughs> she's, a, she's a tar heel so oh was, i respect that you know carolina ties here i, I respect yeah, that yeah she's a tar heel so and that didn't quite get away from that one now, you know, when you see a player who's lined up, you know, outside in a twin, outside in a trips, in a slot, what does that tell you about a player? Well, it tells me that the coaching staff doesn't have them pigeonholed into one into one uh, one role. 
And that makes me wonder why, you know, I chart alignment data too for reception perception, where they line up and what kind of, what that tells you about what kind of player they are, how the team views them. Um, and for a deep threat like Smith, especially, um, I like to see a guy that doesn't just line up, you know, in the flanker or in the X spot, but can line up in the slot, um, line up in multiple positions outside, you know, whether he's tight with the offensive line or like split out wide, like we saw, um, it's it's good to me to see that he can you you know exploit the defense in multiple ways given his gifts. And that's a fine play right yeah. there. This is really important too. Um, it's kind of the first uh, the first we really get to see. Like a good example we could see of is, is fearlessness, and I think that's what separates him in my mind from. Um, other, you know, quote unquote, speed receivers or deep threats is that he he's really, really comfortable in traffic. Like these sort of things don't bother him, you know, with the safety or the deep of the back lurking over over top of him. Um, it actually looks like a corner, not a safety. Or I can't really tell um, from a broadcast angle, but. Um, yeah, I think it's a safety on this case. Yeah, yeah oh, wow. it, look, it looks like you're right. And it just like having that guy present over and that doesn't affect you know, that's not in the back of his mind. He's still making the catch. Yeah, and there's a number of things I love about this play because when I think of when I think of guys who play just the deep threat role, I think of guys like James Hardy back from the um, I don't know for Indiana who, oh, who went to Buffalo, and I think of guys like Goodwin, Marquise Goodwin who also went to Buffalo. Um, so again, Sam, they got it right with Sammy Watkins. Let's see if they can, uh, but when you look at a guy like Smith, things that can tell you that this guy can be a good interior route runner, a good guy in between the hashes in the middle of the field, way he sets up a route. Yeah. Off the line, you see this drive phase. This is what you call a drive phase where you have the, uh, you have the pads over the knees or over the toes even. Um, you're, you know, you're in that sprinter's drive, get off, off the line. You want to keep that as long as you can through the stem to force the defender to play off and be sold on the fact that you are trying to go deep, which isn't hard to do when you're playing Devin Smith because he's established how good of a deep threat he is, but you always want to be selling that mm -hmm. and that helps him make his turn, but we don't see the break, but watch how he's, how flat that break is into this to the side and that he does not leave his feet on this play. You know, that's another thing that I see a lot of guys do in breaks like this, where if it's high, they, even if it's just chest high or, or at helmet height, they tend to leave their feet when they try and do it. He gauges his ball. Well, he doesn't leave his feet. It allows him to actually, you know, make the catch without getting knocked around too hard. Yeah, and this isn't an example of what a lot of people would think of with ball skills, because I do think that his, you know, and you see this a lot on a lot of other plays, but um, you would think that, you, you know, you, you just reference ball skills as sort of a, uh, you know, the, the deep catches and making contested passes, but things like this also, I think I categorize with ball skills, you know, being able to judge a ball, bring it in, and not not worry about the traffic and also like you said make those smart decisions process whether to you know you're going to leave your feet or not and i think you like you mentioned he makes a correct decision by keeping the foot planted making the catch and then continuing downfield yeah now this is a night you know this is one of those this is you know this is another nice aspect of his game as special yeah. teams you know, and you can see some skills even from a punt formation where you have him here at the 50 and watch him, you know, kind of use a release move here. He Absolutely. dips the shoulder, dip and rip basically right here with this move. You see the dip and then use that one arm to rip up. We'll see if we can do it in slow-mo one time. And this is the type of thing that does translate to releases off the line of scrimmage. Dip, rip. And you see the hand clearly uppercut up like that. Yeah, he uses his arms really well. There's another, I don't know, remember what game it was. And actually, I don't even know if he was targeted or not. Um, but he, there's one like curl route in one game where he uh, he really 
does that sort of arm over move where you leave the defender in the dust and, and then you just you present your full body back to the, the quarterback. And, um, yeah, he has really good technique with his arms, which is underrated, you know, to be honest, when you talk about receivers. Yeah, I mean, it's very important because if you're playing press, if you're facing press coverage, you need to be able to get that separation early so that you can stack that man where you're getting your body behind the, the defender. And, you know, we talked about that in our last episode with Devontae yeah. Parker and how, you know. Just, I was just thinking that as you were saying it, you know, that, that people love to talk about Devontae Parker's ability to release from press coverage and release off the line of scrimmage, but he does so much of it with his feet and doesn't do a lot of it with his upper body, you know, or using strength and everything like that. And that's where I, I think is kind of gets overlooked as something that you need to do a lot more in the NFL. Yeah, it's going to be – it could be a rude awakening for him. It may not, but yeah. it could be. It's something that you have to be at least prepared for and go, let's get this guy into camp and let's let's put one of our more physical corners on him and see if he can learn this quick because if yeah. he can, we're going to get this guy on the field pretty fast. If not, he's got some work to do. Yep. All right. Here, now we're talking. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this is all we see at this stage, but the hands are pretty late. They just come up and the ball is almost over his head. Yep. And it's a very, that's a nice angle. Yeah, it really is. And good control of his body just slightly to dip to the right. This is the other thing that I love about good deep patterns okay first of all he doesn't have to do anything with the release other than this little stutter he did but even with that stutter look at how much depth he got off the got off the line it's it's not like he took a, a really small step he's he's driving immediately downfield you got the good drive phase here with that diagonal kind of angle but watch what's really impressive is watch how much he maintains his straight line and stays tight to the defender rather than veering outside too early. He yeah. doesn't pin himself to the sideline. He gives the quarterback a ton of room to throw this ball. And that's so important about mm -hmm. good route play because a receiver, a good example of a player who didn't do this very well for a long time, or at least early in his career for a good bit of years, was Mario Manningham. Had the speed had the quicks, had the ability to go up and win the ball. But damn, if he didn't like veer outside and get to the sideline as fast as he could, he didn't do this, which is just stay outside until the ball arrives and then use that vertical area because I call it vertical set. I call it horizontal separation. It's like get the vertical separation and really all you need is a half step and then use this horizontal space to your advantage at the last moment. Yep. And I think this is a great point because these are sort of the subtleties that I think people people can miss with Smith. But it's it's what, you know, people say, well, he makes it look so easy as a deep threat. This is why he makes it look so easy because he does all this hard work in between the route. Yes. Yes. And even the little things like look at look at the little check he gives, you know, just yep. a little bit to the chest. Yeah, I think we get another angle on it too, and I th yeah. and I think that shows it as well. But something else that stands out too is just um, how he can how he's. It doesn't really look like it, but but he's really changing. And I think they break it down right there too. The the part yeah, you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, at least I hey I did something right once. There we go. <laughs> uh, you're doing a lot of things right. I mean, you got me here tonight, so that's one See, thing. There but, you go. There you go. <laughs> there's two. There's two. There's but um. I think the great thing about Smith, and, and this is kind of an underrated thing about college receivers that, that you can miss, is like how they vary their speed within routes. Because obviously he's a fast guy, um, but you see this a lot with deep threats. Um, they can run real fast straight down the field, and that's really nice, and that's that's super valuable, of course, is, is just straight line speed. But being able to – that's how you get that la – this last sliver of separation is being able to shift gears within routes. Like he's not just running a straight line. Like you said, he's pushing inside, then breaking outside, and you have to be able to like 
vary your speed, not just run at, you know, not just run at 100, 100 miles an hour all the time, shift from 80 to 85 to 90, you know, to get that last second of separation there. It's, it's really, really important and underutilized by a lot of guys with, that are fast. Yeah, because this, this, this form here surely isn't um, what you would see in the 40 at the combine. You yeah, know? right. And, and on, on top of that, he doesn't have a guy jostling him. I've seen lots of deep threats who run four twos and four threes and, um, you know, or even four fours, and you look at that and go, oh, that's great. You know, I'm really impressed by that. But have a defender put his hand on him like that, and they're already, like, trying to – they're already trying to lobby the uh, the official for an yeah. interference call rather than continue the play and make this type of catch. And that's really almost a one-handed grab there. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I mean, he controls it with the one hand. And – it's a mentality issue, you know, to, you know, to be honest. And, and not every receiver has it, uh, but Smith certainly does, like I said, that fearlessness in traffic, not, like you said, not worrying about lobbying for the pass interference, but instead completing the action, not getting jostled. And he's the guy that you wouldn't think has it because he's got, like, short arms and he's small or whatever. But it's, it's so much more mentality than physical uh, ability when it comes to playing in traffic. Absolutely. And here's the thing that when you described earlier in this um, contest, I think that I want to point out. Okay, well, maybe not on this. Okay, so it's, I thought this was consecutive plays for a moment, but it's not. This was the, this was early in the second quarter where he makes this play. And it's a, you know, it's a fine play. Then later in the second quarter, you know, very late in the second quarter, we have ourselves a 44 yard touchdown and he makes it look easy. Yeah. Now this, now this time, you know, look, we have two deep, we have a four, three defense. It's an easy mismatch that they gained here. And probably some of that has to do with some of the things that they've been doing before that using the run play that they would have Devin Smith set up against a, uh, a defensive back. Obviously, they're looking towards run. Probably at this case, if they're going to put a D, they're going to put a safety on on him in the slot. You know, and as soon as they see that at Ohio, Ohio State sees that, they're like, "We're winning here." Yeah, this right. Is, yeah, you know, this is our shot. Yeah, and the defender is already playing outside, thinking that he's going to have, you know, help over the inside here. But there's so much room that was in the split that you know the quarterback and Devin Smith know right away that they're going to win this. Yeah. And it's just yeah, it, it really is easy. Yeah, it's just too late. It was too late at like the at the 40, really. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not going to, we're not going to talk about that because I want to see more blocks before I say whether or not he's like a, he's a good blocker or not. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that was not a good play, but no. I, but won't, we won't judge him on the basis of that alone. That was just a mixed diagnosis to begin with. And then like, it just all water trickled down. Well, here we go. Blocking on the screen. Yeah, that's a little better effort there. Yeah, definitely, you know, gets a good pop. Yep, that's that's better. Absolutely. You know, I, and I don't remember. I know his bench press at the combine was either like really good or really poor, but I can't remember. Um, and and bench press in general is not like a great uh, example of strength, but it is something to note. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you you do. I mean, that is something that that is helpful. And and, and you know, I think again, it's an area where, for a wide receiver, you're going to probably have the greatest opportunity for improvement is is upper body strength. Um, you know, so it, it, as long as they have the basic size, and I think Smith does have enough size that you look at him and say, you know, when you're in the 190, 200 pound range, you're big enough. Yep. Yeah, 196, I think, something like that. Yeah. Now, a different quarterback here. Good point. Yeah, and last time it was with JT Barrett. And all the games that I have for reception perception were with Barrett. Um, 
And so this is kind of the evolution of what people thought about Smith, and it has a lot to do with the quarterback because he can do this. Yeah, and even right off the bat, I mean, again, selling a vertical route. Yeah. What's funny is he's this route. Look how far over his pads he is on this. Right. This could be a little bit of a tell even if if he's doing this consistently, but I would say not really because what we've seen is – Sometimes he's this far over. Sometimes he's not, and it's and even on deeper routes, he's not always that. He's not digging that deep. No, he's not. That last, I mean, the the last the touchdown we saw in the Michigan State game, he was definitely not over his pads like that. Um, and it, you know that was an easy attempt. But okay, then this is good. And now I'm talking over myself, but that's all right. <laughs> but this is good. This I you know you really like to see this. This is this is where he's kind of tracking where the ball should be, not where he's going. Um, and again, just just sees that the defender is looking into the back, you know, into the middle of the field and cuts outside, gives himself an advantage, even though it ends up being a contested situation. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it's a nice setup of this route too, where he's, he has, he knows this route's going to break outside. Yeah. But the defender's playing that outside position. And just enough of a dip to sell that, and one, and that was all it took. And, but I love this part, like you say, because this is, again, consistently now. We've seen this on two passes, at least, where he's got a man on his hip, and he's got to win the ball. But this time he's breaking inside to do that. Well, and, and this, this is oh, – go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, and this is really nice position – because, you know, he doesn't reach out to win the ball, but he posts up and gets his back to the man. And it's like, you're going to have to go through my chest to get this yeah. ball. Yeah, he gives himself, even though he doesn't extend his hands, he gives himself really that that effort, of, or that, that area of comfort, you know, like you said, using, using the body instead of his extension. Um, and this is really, this is what separates him from, most deep threats, especially at the college level, and all the guys in this class, in my mind. I mean, Dorsett is faster than than Devin Smith, but you see plenty of examples in my mind that would lead you to be concerned about Dorsett's ability to play in the air um, when he's asked, you know, when asked is to leave his feet. Um, it, 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 there, there are just some times where the ball just drops down back to the ground with him. Um, whereas Smith, I think he's just consistently shows that he's comfortable in these situations that, you know, he is the aggressor and will go up and get the ball and bring it back down. Yeah. And he does it in a variety of ways and I'm not worried about his hand size, you know, guys no. like Lockett and, um, Dorsett and Chris Harper, they're all guys that I, I, when I watch them go up and try and can win a ball like that, they can do it, but it seems like it takes a little bit more for them to corral the ball sometimes. They fight the ball sometimes in ways that you don't see that with with guys like Smith. Yeah. And if you say to yourself, well, why is, a, why is this punt play so important? You know, why is it important to show these types of plays? Because isn't he going to be a high enough pick? And the answer is, yeah. But Brandon Lloyd was a good college football player. Um, and he play, he started his career in San, San Francisco doing covering special teams just like this. He got on the field because he was blocking punts for for the San Francisco 49ers. So, you know, even guys in the first four rounds of a, of a draft – oftentimes begin their play on special teams. Was that our man, or am I missing something here? Let's see. I, I, don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it. so. No. All right. That was a late diagnosis. Yeah, not good there. Yeah, and this is, you know, again, two plays where we've seen a diagnosis where he was a little late. These are difficult diagnoses to make in space like this. Yeah, um, right. You know, but it's something he's going to have to get better at. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if, you know, one of the big values of having such a deep threat is they stretch the field for the running game, you know. But if you're going to run to that side, then with all that extra space, you, you want to see the receiver, uh, you know, 
help out by, by throwing a good block. Yeah, absolutely. Especially on a run to this side where the guy makes the play. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, you know, this is the, like you said, I love the fact that you mentioned this, the value here, all this, look, you're getting a, you're basically getting an eight yard cushion mm -hmm. and you better when you get to this stage, if you can block, if you're setting up here rather than setting up over here, you know, if you can get this man, Ezekiel Elliott is probably going to, instead of Ezekiel Elliott getting hit and dropped at the first down mark or maybe a little behind it, it's a guaranteed first down probably yeah. here at the 40, at the 41 or the 40, which, you know, it's two or three yards. But the difference in the NFL, that could be a difference between a first down and, and not. Yeah, that's, that is a really good point. Here we, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, when I was in college, my friend and I, my friend had a synthesizer, and we would watch Raiders games with James Jet. I don't know if you know who James Jet is. Uh, we've, you know, we we covered this when we met. I don't know any of these players yeah. that you talk about. James, James Jet. If for those of you who don't know, James Jet was a short little track guy who had ungodly speed, and he he had an unbelievable yards per catch rate. And we would we would play like the the sound effect of bombs dropping from from bombers out of the you know out of the cargo bay when we would watch long plays like this. So whenever I see a bomb, I always hear the. <laughs> but there we go. I'll see if I can find a James Jet highlight in a few minutes later on here. Another, again, nice. another yep break inside come back out and that's this is that little separation that you know and i'm talking about and, and this is cool too because he he doesn't go up for this ball here but he's confident in his ability to get it without doing so yeah so I, I like to see that Late um, hands. yep yeah the hands oh my gosh that that was that's one thing that you know, through watching a lot more receivers and, and, and this year especially, something that is just, again, another un, uh, underappreciated, overlooked asset is, is late hands. Um, it really makes the difference in a contested situation. Um, guys like uh, Perryman's another one from this class who I think struggles with his, the, the timing of his hands. Um, Coach is a train wreck with it. But, I mean, but, you know, like there's, there's just some of these guys that, that – it, it makes a huge difference in plays like this. Yeah. Because if he throws them up too early, I mean, it's just common sense. If he throws them up too early, the defender gets tipped to it, and he uh, he has more of a chance to interfere with the action, whereas when Smith throws them up late, the advantage is his. Yeah. And a common, you know, they're not the same player, so don't nobody get too excited here when I say this, but another pl a player who was great with late hands, who also made things look easy and was probably the best in terms of late hands that I've ever seen is Randy Moss. Yeah, I knew that's who you were going to say. <laughs> now, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm young enough, to, or I'm old enough to know who Randy Moss is. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there probably would be no reception perception if it wasn't for Randy Moss, and I don't know what that says about me that I just always was so drawn to him as a person personality and uh and as a football player uh oh, that's really I, one. yeah i love randy moss i mean certainly had maturity issues but as a football player are you kidding me i wish <laughs> i just wish um i wish the Re the randy moss brett Favre combo lasted more than a few games oh, and yeah. didn't happen at the end of their careers right and there wasn't some you know catering incident or whatever and brad childress wasn't involved that would, that would yeah nice. yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah, a few variables there yeah, that just would have been um. That would have been fun. Yeah, it would have been a whole lot of fun. Might have made my decade of watching football at that time. Yes, and now this is something I want to I want to talk about because this is this is it's, it's a simple play uh, as far as the curl route goes, but um, when I you know I can I can bring it back to a lot of what I found from his reception perception um scores and this is this was from the five game sample that i took the curl route was the second most run to the nine route um at 21.6 percent 
and it, it was he was very successful on those. Um, and I think that really is important um, when you look at it from an analytics perspective because um, you know deep threats in the NFL. This is this is the route that they get to exploit on other than vertical patterns because they get so much cushion. Um, and it, Mike Wallace is a guy that's a really good example of this. Um, if you want to paint the picture from what went wrong in Miami and you want to shift the blame to the quarterback, there are a lot there are a lot of passes on film where Wallace got this cushion, made a good curl, a comeback to the quarterback, um, and had a lot of space to work with. And Tannehill just didn't see it, just missed him uh, through too short or whatever. So left a lot of yards on the field that way. This is something that when I when I watch deep threats, I want to see how good they are timing the break on the curl because it's an advantageous situation that's going to be created a lot for them. And Smith obviously executes it here. And as far as his reception perception sample goes, he really this was one, another thing he was very good at. Yeah, that's a great point. And I love how you talk about this route being something that's kind of the change up to the or the setup oftentimes to the. Uh, the deeper plays and you see the bend of the hips here um, to, to make a sudden stop and so that's a nice that's a nice move right there to be able to get that separation but what I love is what also further encourages or makes it difficult to um, defend a player like Smith is that when he makes the catch now he's tough to defend in the open field yeah. now you're talking about getting the yards and getting the first down. And I, one of the things we see consistently with him is getting those extra yards, those extra three to four yards. It doesn't seem like a lot. And you may go, oh, well, he's not making big plays, but he's setting up big plays with this. Because yeah. when you get, when you make this play here, that means that, and the defender, the defender is like, okay, let me come back and tackle him. And I can't tackle him. And I'm and I just gave up four or five yards for the first down. That means next time I might be tempted as that defender to have to play him a little tighter yeah. because I'm giving up these first downs left and right, and I'm getting slowly killed. So now I'm going to play him a little tighter, and now Devin Smith's going to blow by me. Yeah, then, <laughs> then you're going to get toasted. Yeah, I, I mean you're you're totally right because you can't you can't give up these plays as a defense, and you can't give up first downs like this. Um, trying to play the long ball, but then you, you're you either going to, A, you're going to have to play tighter, you're going to have to allocate more resources over there, and then that obviously opens things up, you know, on the other side of the field or in the middle of the field or whatever. But, yeah, the, the ability to capitalize on these plays is so important when you're watching a deep threat receiver. Yeah, it's the game within the game, as you said, allocating the other resources, maybe at the safety or, you know, again, it's like the slow death, you know, some players, you know, some coaches are going to like, yeah, you can play off on him unless, you know, by the third quarter, you've been giving up, you've given up six first downs. Now it's time to play a little bit tighter, right. but if they might have scouted a guy and go, he's not going to get you much after the catch if you, and you can come up and tackle him and, and it should be okay. And then they'll feel okay about, you know, setting up second and eights and second and sevens. But, you know, when you get first down after first down like this, yeah, that, that becomes a bigger problem. Yeah. And this is the cool part about Smith and why he's really become one of my favorite players in the draft, just from, from a guy that I, you know, that I've really enjoyed evaluating and also that I feel like, I added something, or I tried to, tried to, whether anybody's listening or not, whatever, you know, I tried to add something to the conversation is like, he's really the perfect example of a player that just because we didn't get to see it a lot, you don't see a lot of those plays. You don't see him in space, make, you know, making guys miss or whatever, just because you don't see it a lot doesn't mean he can't do it. Yeah. And, and that's exactly true. And I think that what's, this is the case where when, you know, when you're looking at skill players, oftentimes people are so used to what you see is what you get with the player. Like you see one game and you see a lot, but I think that when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to certain things like this, you know, the, the, you can see different samples. And if you, even if you see a, a play or two where he definitively shows what you're, what you're looking for, um, that's good enough. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we certainly see that when we're talking about defensive players or guys on the, on, on, at the line of scrimmage. This is a nice double move. You see, again, selling the shoulder and getting downfield, and it's going to be a really nice catch. 
you know, in tight coverage. He's having to wait on the ball because, again, this should be a ball that should be placed about right over here where his back should be to it, and she should just yeah. be able to run under it. But he has to make the tough play. And he does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, talk about the late hands and the uh, – and, again, he doesn't bring his hands up together, doesn't, doesn't display perfect technique, but as a deep threat, that's what you're going to have to do. You know, you're going to have to do that on plays like this. And his ability to kind of go off script, to be patient, to wait on the ball, um, you know, come face forward when he should have had his back turned, that's really, that's really important because a lot of what you're going to be doing in the deep game, as much as it is, you know, precision and execution in some ways, it's a lot of, you know – backyard ball and, 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 you know, freelancing that you're going to have to do. And he does that really well too. Yeah. And there are some techniques involved here that are consistent when you start to watch players in these situations, especially on fade routes or routes that look like a fade route or have to be improvised into one like this. One of them is right here. See how the hands on the top of the shoulder, yeah. see how this hand is coming up high. He's not leaving leaping into the air with his hands but he's getting his hands over the hands of the defender so that when it's time to leap his hands aren't going to be free of the defender and not being able to be pulled down where the defender can have his hands over the biceps instead he's free to make that adjustment late yeah and again good body control yeah very good body control, and it's a ball that he catches at a late window and has to make a tough adjustment and gets three three feet, you know, three steps in before he even goes out of bounds. Very nice work. Yeah, definitely. We're seeing a little bit of this tighter coverage, too, the last – the last two plays, or at least guys lining up close to him on the uh, on the line of scrimmage. Absolutely. More punt team coverage. Punt I'll never be comfortable seeing a punter wear nine, like a, a double digit jersey, like ninety five or whatever, like this. But you know, it's a story for another day. Yeah, he's not Brunk. He's not you know Ernie Nevers here. You know. That's I don't know who I don't know who you're talking, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I shouldn't even know who I'm talking about with that guy. My grandparents probably don't even know who I'm talking about. So I don't think I know anybody named Ernie. Now, now Chase now Chase Stewart would know who Ernie Nevers is. No. You know, no. And Chase is Chase is closer to your age than mine, but Chase is abnormal. Yeah, so. Chase is weird. Yeah. Don't tell him I said so because he's pretty uh he's pretty cut too, so don't tell him I said that. <laughs> We can both take him. We'll just we'll just make sure we turn a corner. We he turns the corner. And we ambush him first. But uh, that's sounds the difference. Good. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, Vegas next year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so there you have it. Oh no, this would be pretty good film watching actually right here yeah. on Albert King, Stevie Ray Vaughan. But that's for another time too. Yeah. Well, you know we do, but I know we both have a music background, so um, yeah. yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> Yeah, you bet. So, yeah, I mean that's a that's a pretty good indication of what we see from from Smith. I mean, I think another another game that I have seen from him that I think is a fairly quick one is um, let's see, Devin Smith. Cal. You seen the uh, you seen this Cal game at all? Yeah, this is 2013. Yeah, this is yeah. a fun one. Yeah, I mean, this one has some things that, you know, I think because it's a quick one, we could we could do real quick before we go. I mean, you see some more of the short stuff. Sure. No, that wasn't short. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, I mean, again, they they set up that screen and then they go to the they go to the deep ball, and now we get his you know fourth quarterback he's worked with in two years. Um, but I mean, certainly you're, you know, I mean, again, a lot of this, you know, when you look at a player like him, 
where would you like to see where would you where where would you like to see Devin Smith play if you had a chance like with a number of teams where do you think that he could make either an early impact or a lasting impact oh well you know this might be a little biased but I think he would fit really well in Carolina um, I think that team needs a lot of speed they need speed um, Kelvin Benjamin obviously has uh, the ability to threaten defense you know deep because he can win contested catches but a guy that can just truly stretch the field they haven't had that you know other than Ted Ginn um, and, you know I saw a little flashes of it from Philly Brown but but whatever I mean a guy that really is a young um, true like deep game artist I think Cam Newton would really benefit from that um, Baltimore comes to mind obviously as a, a natural replacement for for Torrey Smith um, but I, I think they need I would. I don't know. I, I think that that's that's a good spot. Obviously, with with how good of Flacco is playing the ball, uh, playing the deep game as well. But he's he's a tough one because I I in Seattle before they traded their first round pick. I know everybody wants him to get a big body, but um, a, a real field stretcher for Russell Wilson because he just throws such a good deep ball that I want to see somebody on the other end actually that can you know can 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 demonstrate. Um, winning on those deep passes. Oh, so, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I'm yeah. with you on Carolina too, because certainly they do. They need a deep threat to complement it. Now, here's an example of a nice little route. Look at the hip. Look at how he stops there. I mean, you know, it's a couple steps here, but look how he bends at the top of that route. Yeah. He's really, I mean, really flexible hips. Yeah. And you're gonna, we're going to get another chance to see it right there. He sits in that chair pretty well. Yeah, he does. Yeah, I would. Def I definitely agree with you with those choices. I think you know if they were ready to just you know another team. Well, Tory Smith is in San Francisco, so you know probably not there. But. Um, Ugh, I don't want to send any, I, no. I don't want to send any receivers to San Francisco to be yeah. honest with you with what they've what they've got dealing with behind center right now and the limitations but it's another topic sure <laughs> sure I understand you know but I mean, certainly I mean there anybody who's looking for a deep threat with a guy who can also you know do a number of different things in a variety of situations I mean Smith is going to be a good option there for for a team i mean do you do you think i mean I, i'm not one who likes to project rounds but you know just for the fun and the entertainment of it i mean do you think he's a first round caliber wide receiver um if it wasn't for who else is in this class say you know say Devonte parker and and amari cooper and kevin white and maybe even doriel green beckham weren't even in the weren't even in this class you know would devin smith be a first round talent to you um or or why why or why not well to separate it from the draft class like you said because i think that does matter a lot for just like there's a lot of analysts that have you know and, and i don't you and i neither of us put out full rankings for draft classes um but some of our peers that do that they only have like 15 or 20 first round picks um so in this year i definitely think he's worth the first round pick now, if it were other years, I don't know, maybe not. But if you're gonna sell, if you're gonna sell me, or if you want me to sell you on the case, sorry, I'm fumbling my words here at midnight. But, <laughs> um, but if you want me to sell you on why he should be a first round pick, and I and I do believe that he should be, um, it's it is that trump card ability. Like, I have confidence that when he walks into an NFL building, he is going to be. A, a good deep threat right away. I mean, I think he's shown everything that you'd want to see from a guy that can threaten and make do on in the deep game. I mean, he really is a deep game artist. That's that's what I called him on the first Vine I ever tweeted out uh, of, of one of his games. It just really can paint the full picture of, of the deep pass. Um, so, and that's super valuable. I mean, people want to say like, oh, well, that's a, that's, he's a role player. Then, you know, it's it's limited in what he can do. But if that is all he ever does, I mean, sign me up. How many guys are really, really that good deep threats in the NFL that if I can bring this guy in and I'm sold right away that he's going to be able to add that to my offense, I mean, I'm fine with that. But, to you know, to, to, to package on with that, 
there are so many of these little nuances that we pointed out here tonight and are present just all over his tape that, that really, I think, you know, can lead you to believe that he can be a complete receiver, a down-to-down -down threat in the short game, the intermediate game, um, and just some of the technical, like, facets of, of, of how he, you know, can sell a route, how he can gain a release from the line of scrimmage. Um, I think this, that's enough evidence right there to think that he can be more of more than just the deep threat he was at Ohio State because that's really all they asked him to do. They didn't ask him to do much else. So, um, like I said, I, I'm confident that he can be worthy of a first-round pick um, just because his baseline transition – his baseline projection to the pro level, I'm so comfortable with that. If that's all I get, I'm f I'm fine with that. Like I'm not gonna poo poo it. Okay, you got me in the first round. You picked me a really good deep threat. Matt, 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 I agree with you completely. <laughs> 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 because it's yeah, I mean, I really do. It's uh, I think he's an underrated player, even by the standard of people talking about him as a possible first round pick. Because I look at a guy like Mike Wallace, and if you asked me. Well, I want Mike Wallace with what he does now and what Devin Smith should be able to do based on what I've seen. I'd rather have Devin Smith hands down. Yeah, um, I agree with you. You know, if I could get – if if I were Buffalo and I've spent all these years either getting a possession player or a deep threat who can't be a possession player other than until they got Sammy Watkins, um, I would love to get Devin Smith. And then you have Robert Woods, Devin Smith, and Sammy Watkins as your trio. And now you need a quarterback. But <laughs> at least at least you have the receivers. At least you have three young guys who you can get a quarterback in there who hopefully will be good enough that you have Robert Woods, who, who I think is quick enough and talented enough to play the slot if you need be, but can also do some outside work. You have mm -hmm. Sammy Watkins, who we know can play the slot, but also can be an outside threat. Um, and, you know, I haven't seen your reception perception on him, but I know you did one, uh, you know, yeah. recently. So can you that, give me what, – what's your lowdown on him a little bit? On Watkins? Yeah. Oh, wow. This is, this is heavy here for the end of the show because he's one of the ones that didn't come out that well. Okay. Um, as far as, you know, how often he beat man coverage and everything. But, okay, so this was the first – you actually did, and after you and I, we, we talked on the phone one time, and you, you, know, you encouraged me to write these preview blog posts. He was the first one that I wrote about after that conversation because I think he's a really good illustration of how, how these reception perception statistics need context. And if you want to read this, it's on my site, thebackyardbanter.com. Um, you know, because he was really, I think, asked to do an awful lot as a rookie, I mean, way too much. Like, yes. you, you look at guys like... Savior type of work. Yeah, and, and really, like, that that just wasn't fair. Um, and so, like, and, and again, I think I had him was one of my, I think, three or five best players from last year's draft. Um, and I still feel comfortable that he's going to be a really good player. Like, and this is the problem with anything on Twitter these days. So I wrote a, a, a quote-unquote negative article on Sammy Watkins, um, you know, my reception perception data didn't look favorably on Watkins. But like I say in the article, everything needs context. And um, just what he was asked to do for what he was coming out of Clemson, because I think you, you, know, you, know, you and I can agree that while we, he showed plenty of potential to be a great route runner, a great technician, that wasn't what he was being asked to do as a, as a, uh, as a player at Clemson. And so then expecting him to jump right in and be a number one receiver was too much. And that's why he had a well below average success rate versus man coverage score because he's having to go up against guys like read this twice a year, you know, all these other really good corners with, you know, basically being asked to win one-on-one -on -one isolation situations. And he just wasn't ready for that. Not to mention he wasn't healthy for a lot of the games last year. So while I am – definitely from like a dynasty perspective. And that's where I've done a lot of these wars. It's like I'm saying, if you haven't altered your expectation of Watkins as a dynasty asset, given what these other two guys have shown you to this point, I think you're being a little foolish, but I still am confident in him being a good player, despite what his reception perception statistics show, just because I believe in his talent. I just think that 
I'm a little concerned after what I saw as as a rookie, but not so much to like completely pump the brakes or you know get out now. Um, you know, as far as a fantasy player it goes, it's different because the situation is just such a train wreck. Um, but my, yeah, and my interpretation of what you just explained and what I know is is very similar. But it would just be it would just be to add this is that um, what scares me isn't his ability. What scares me is his fit yeah. because there. You, you know, they had a quarterback change. He was injured. And, yeah, he was asked to go against top guys. Even top receivers oftentimes in their first year, some of the top rookies don't get have to face the number one guy all the time. Now people yeah. might go, well, Odell Beckham. Well, Odell Beckham played out of his mind. Yeah. He was, he, he's an exception. That's great. But still, you know, Anquan Bolden had Larry Fitzgerald on the opposite side of him. Randy Moss had Chris Carter, you know. So, Mike Evans had Vincent Jackson, you know, it, if you're talking about a recent example. Exactly. So you're oftentimes, you know, you're oftentimes looking at those scenarios and you have to understand that they're, they're not drawing the top corner all the time. So Watkins is facing that, and now he's getting – now they don't have really a quarterback that's an established guy, and they have Buddy Ryan coming in. Right. Oh, or not Buddy Ryan, but Buddy, <laughs> Buddy's kid. Rex Ryan. Rex, yeah. yeah, Sexy Rexy. So now they got Sexy Rexy coming in, and we, we've seen how, how um, just dynamic offenses have been with the, with this defensive minded head coach and and who he chooses as coordinators and yeah I would be worried too as a dynasty owner to a, a certain extent from a fantasy angle but at the same time if they get a quarterback in there if they can get a good quarterback in there and you know there may be some hope so he's a guy that I think more than anything it's a it's a more of a caution you, you're holding him or you're you're downgrading expectations, but you're keeping one foot still in the hopeful area because if the right scenarios come into play, he could be a buy low in an instant. Yeah. Um, totally good explanation from you. You know, and I just think there are some some members of the, of the dynasty community and just the, the analysis community that kind of have him in this sort of beyond reproach category like even though he even though he wasn't quite to the standard of Odo Beckham or Mike Evans like you know I, so what I, what I want from reception perception is people to be able to look at that article and look at the data and be like okay well there's a little cause for concern not like well whatever like no oh. no worries and and that's all I want you know but of course you know how everything goes it's like, sure yeah oh well he has I mean his, his success rate against man coverage was 49.5 percent which you know um is that's well below the average but yeah. like I said it, I think that paints a little cause for concern but also but there's context and everything else will be discussed so I, I'm 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 fine with with him as a as a talent as a player but just the situation is such a nightmare um, that you wonder. That you wonder, like, how is that? How is he? Is he going to be able to 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 rise above that? Um, hey, it's it's a long, long climb. You're talking to someone who had him as a number one overall receiver in yeah. in in my rankings last year, and who wrote a blog, wrote like three blog posts on him, and one of them I think was, "Dear God, please may I have a prayer." For, I think I, I it basically started as off as like a prayer to get him on <laughs> on a team that I would like, you know. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. Even from that standpoint, I agree with you completely. I mean, I think that you need to have caution with a guy like that, and that's the value of that's the value of nuance that you need to have with an article. And you wrote a nuanced article, and not people people aren't always going to get that when it comes to uh, you know when they want to see things in black and white when there's shades of gray. So, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, it was great having Matt on the show, and we'll definitely have him on again. Um, we are actually saving a player. I've been saving a player for Matt, so we're gonna we're gonna hopefully get a chance to watch him within the next six to eight weeks. And uh, you know, because it's been a long time coming. And uh, thanks again for staying. You know, for for watching this show. Um, it's been a fun experiment thus far. That uh, we have over a thousand um, a thousand subscribers at this point which is pretty crazy because I really honestly thought that this was just going to be a show for my guests and me to, to just get a chance to talk and we just record it for posterity. So I'm glad you guys like it and uh, you guys have a good weekend.